The Exorcist is a movie that changed horror and it still stands as an amazing piece of filmmaking that so many have tried to imitate. Filled with incredibly creepy imagery, hidden details and a lot of things that you have to figure out on your own, this is the kind of movie that I think's perfect for a breakdown. Often dubbed as the scariest film of all time, The Exorcist is probably a movie that you heard about long before you ever saw it. As a kid, I remember its reputation being something that preceded it and I can vividly recall a special edition advert being shown on TV which even managed to give me nightmares even though it was shorter than Pete Davidson's last relationship. Now, Upon finally plucking up the courage to watch it as a kid, I could definitely see why this was a film that people were still talking about decades later. There's things in this movie that will stick with you forever and the lacerated Reagan strapped to a bed is probably one of the most iconic images in film history. Amen. Now though it's got this massive reputation, the movie itself actually had much simpler beginnings and the story began life as a book by author William Blatty. Blatty actually makes a cameo later on in the movie and he too plays someone working on the film alongside Burke. Based on the real life exorcism of Roland Doe, Blatty changed up the details of that to alter the sex and age of the apparently possessed victim. Doe was of course a pseudonym but since Blatty was taking creative license, he didn't rely too heavily on knowing the true details of the case. Now on the theatrical cut Blu-ray, director William Friedkin talks about how he was fascinated with the story which took place in Georgetown. Though it's horrifying, Friedkin did say that the child grew up having no memory of the event and that he actually went on to have a successful career at NASA. The boy's family apparently went through all the stages we see Reagan going through in the film and they also visited doctors, psychologists and sought advice from friends before eventually going to the church. Weirdly, the book itself failed to sell well in its first run and it left the author in dire financial straits. However, it gained a lot of critical acclaim and good word of mouth helped it to be picked up by movie studios around Hollywood. Obviously, it would go on to become a mammoth movie and I think at the heart of its success lies the idea that people almost feel like they're confirming their faith when they go to see it. The book's obviously based on a true story and it boils down to a battle between the Catholic Church and the forces of evil. Due to its reputation, the movie almost feels like a test to watch and when you go through it, you're very much seeing if you can beat the devil as well and come out the other side. There's also of course many myths and legends that always surround movies like this and just like The Omen, rumours of supernatural things happening on set were part and parcel of the marketing. Unless, unless the curse is real. Now, The Exorcist is filled with several subliminal images that really add to the horror on a deeper level. Appearing on screen for a split second, these frames embed themselves into our subconscious and are nervous even though they happen so quickly that we barely even register them. Now, the film basically boils down to Pazuzu possessing Reagan and throughout it we get several flashes of his face to let us know he's always watching. Some of these images are toned down depending on what version you watch and there are a few that only appear in the theatrical version. However, I've gone through both films for this to point out when they happen and hopefully when you revisit the movie, you'll find a new appreciation of it. God the Lord of all creation, gain for your holy apostles the power to tramp underfoot serpents and scorpions. Now early on in the film, we see the statue of Pazuzu and this later appears in Reagan's bedroom. This is pretty obvious and well lit, so we instantly see it. However, in the theatrical cut, there's a hidden statue in the room that only eagle-eyed viewers will spot. As Chris leaves her daughter Reagan's room, we take a lot of focus on her walking through the house and you might not notice it, but Pazuzu's actually in this frame. Upon boosting the brightness, you can catch his statue in the corner and this adds an extra layer of horror to this very mundane moment. Now, there's also a quick flash of the statue's head that we get when she opens the door. I've slowed this right down so you can see it, but it appears on screen for what's basically three frames and it gives the idea that Pazuzu is waiting in this room. His face is throughout the house, so when Chris first enters the kitchen, we can see it flicker in and out for what's roughly a second. It's gone just as quickly as it arrives, but it's so creepy and unnerving. A lot of these were of course made in a time before physical media allowed people to pause and rewind films and thus many watching it might have wondered if they saw what they thought they saw. Now, this face is something which is constant throughout the film and it pops in and out of scenes at several points in the movie. During Reagan's examination at roughly the 33 minute mark, we see her eyes open as she lays on the bed. The demon then quickly flashes on screen just before it vanishes and though this is a very low key scene, this instantly grabs your attention. 
Later on, a similar shot appears in Father Karras' dreams, and we can catch the demon as he runs towards his mother. In a blink and you'll miss a moment, Pazuzu appears in between the cuts, letting us know that he has infected the character's mind. We also get a moment just before this where we see Karras' mother in a dark black room, and this is shot in a similar way to how the demon's face appears. Now, a shot of the demon appears like this later on during the exorcism at roughly the 1 hour 45 mark. I'm saying roughly because, depending on what version you watch, there will be different scenes that throw the timing off. Anyway, as Reagan's being exorcised, we see the lights flicker on and off, and during one of these black spots, we get a quick flash of Pazuzu. Now, Pazuzu isn't the only face that flashes on screen, and we actually get Karis's mother appear just before he jumps out the window. When the father takes the demon into himself, he looks up at the curtains and you can catch the face of his mother fading in and out. Superimposition is used brilliantly in the film as well, and at roughly the 1 hour 2 minute mark we see Reagan turn her head to the camera during the hypnosis scene. In a blink and you'll miss a moment, we get a few frames where the demon superimposed over the top of her face just before she attacks. This is repeated later on roughly at the 1 hour 45 mark when she turns and looks directly at the camera comes right after the head turn, and if you pause the frame then you'll notice the left side of her face actually has Pazuzu's. There are two eyes together in that area, and it really adds to how creepy that this moment is. It's such a nice touch that throws the viewer off slightly, and it also lets us know there's two entities trapped inside this one body. That is of course Reagan and the demon, and it's moments like this that really add to the film. The director really stretched the limits of terror within a film as well, and he went beyond shots like this to toy with us on an aura level. Sound is used expertly throughout the film, with Friedkin also adding in unsettling noises so that we can never feel relaxed. Pig squeals are used when Reagan's tossing and turning, and the sound of bees is placed at several points early on in the film. Now if you're enjoying the video, then the power of YouTube compels you, the power of YouTube compels you to hit the thumbs up button, and don't forget to subscribe for breakdowns like this on the best movies ever made. Now for the rest of the video, I will be going through the entire director's cut scene by scene to talk about all the creepy hidden details in it that elevate the film. I did watch both versions for this breakdown, but with that having more stuff in it, I think it's probably the best place to put focus on. Now the longer cut actually begins with two shots that aren't included in the theatrical, and in this we start off at the house before we cut to the Virgin Mary statue. Personally, I find this a bit weird, and I know that the Exorcist fan community share the same belief. Basically, starts as a confusing way to kick things off because we immediately jump from here over to Iraq. The original theatrical cut began in Iraq and skipped over these scenes which just throws us straight into the mystery. Normally when you're making establishing shots like this, you don't then want to jump over to another location, but I think it's put in place because this is where the demon manifests. Houses are supposed to be places of security where we can relax and, well, be at home. Horror tends to subvert this though when it places the danger in with us which subconsciously throws us off. The house of course pulls from the film's extremely famous poster, which is a shot taken from Marin's arrival in Georgetown. With a light beaming out of the window like what we get here, they may have wanted to start things off by just referencing what this film's known for. It's also how the film closes out too, with us getting focus on it boarded up, and the statue of course gets desecrated which sets that up later down the line. Now the use of this window actually took inspiration from the artist René Magritte, and namely his Empire of Light paintings which bear somewhat of a resemblance to what we see. Now what I think The Exorcist does brilliantly is that it doesn't spell the information out for you and you have to figure things out as you watch the movie. Throughout the film you're meant to take in the information and fill in the blanks and this is definitely seen in the case of the statue as we never learn who vandalised it. However there is a clue and the statue is covered in clay which we know Reagan has access to. In the film she makes clay animals near the start and thus she does have a way of carrying this act out. This also ties into Burke's death, which I'll talk about more later on in the video, but there is a clue that Reagan was involved with this as well. Lieutenant Kinderman at one point searches the spot where Burke died at, and we see that he finds a little clay model. Kinderman later comes across one in the home when he meets Chris for the first time, and he asks if Reagan made it. This shows that the character was involved in that, the vandalism, and it also ties in with Pazuzu brilliantly. This is also meant to reference the Pazuzu head we see throughout the movie, and it shows that Reagan visited the scene at some point. Anyway, after the titles we cut to Iraq and find Father Marin, played by Max von Sydow. The actor was actually 44 at the time, but they added old age makeup to him to make him seem more mature. 
this is one of those guys to me who was seemed like he was old forever and now knowing that they did this in one of his most famous appearances it does start to make sense now friedkin did film on location for this opening and you can see how much authenticity that it adds to the movie he could have easily just put this on a set but it adds to the gripping feeling that we get in this opening friedkin didn't have it easy either and this was due to iraq and u.s relations at the time Americans had been forbidden from filming there and thus Friedkin had to hire an old British crew and promised the government that he'd teach them some of their film techniques. Now this opening is often forgotten when you think back on the movie but it easily sets the tone for the rest of the film. At the base of the mound, Marin is introduced digging and this is alongside the rest of the workers there. It sets him up as a humble figure, escalating the idea that this is very much a small man versus an insurmountable evil. Discovering the statue head of Pazuzu, we see dust and wind blow, and this happens as he pulls it out. Now, Pazuzu is actually a demon who's said to be the personification of the northwest wind. There's lots of texts on him, and in the legends, he'd use this to carry across disease and famine. Wind is something that signals the characters near, and at several points in the film, we see it blowing to signify his arrival. Anyway, in the next shot we see a man pouring liquid out of a spout that looks like a pig with wings. The Pazuzu statue is a winged beast, and bird-like creatures appear throughout the film to subliminally carry this idea. Regan creates a giant clay bird, and when Karis goes through her drawings, we see that she's also created some creepy birds and a winged lion. The Pazuzu statue also has a snake for a dick, and later on the Virgin Mary statue is given one by Regan using the clay models. Anyway, Marin makes his way through the city, and we very much get the idea that there's an evil presence watching him throughout. Friedkin masterfully shoots the scene so that there's this constant feeling of paranoia, and it feels like he's either being watched by the demon or by his forces. This is hinted to us when Marin comes across a group of men hammering away, and one removes his hat and reveals his eye. We can see that he's blind in one, and this appears to almost be fully white. This was done on purpose, with it deliberately appearing similar to the white eyes that Regan gets later on in the movie. Marin has of course faced off against demons before, so we can see why this would be so unnerving to him. Now we cut to an office, which is where we get focus on a clock, and then the statue head. Here Marin looks at a St. Joseph medal that was unearthed during the dig, and this seemingly appears later on at the start of Karis's dream. Now a necklace identical to this was actually worn by his mother, which has caused a lot of fan speculation. It has been said by the creative team that the medals are in fact different, but they symbolise why these two characters eventually end up coming together. Karis later wears his mother's medal, and it's theorised that Regan actually rips this off at the end of the film because the demon needs its protection torn away so that it can enter his body. It's later given as a gift at the end of the movie, and this symbolises that the ordeal is now over. Now when Marin's looking at the Pazuzu head, the man in the office says evil against evil. Though Pazuzu is an evil entity, it's actually so evil that it would drive other evil spirits away because it was thought to have made a claim. Now the clock then stops behind Marin, and I believe that this symbolises the demons telling him that his time is up. He's nearly hit by a speeding car later on, and gods rush him when he's getting out of his car. Nice little detail here is that we can actually see a crack in his windscreen, and many have theorised this is a gunshot mark, possibly hinting out that he's been fired at before. Marin then catches the statue with his son on its back, and this creates a chilling silhouette. The Iraq scene itself starts off with the sun, but this blocking it's symbolic of the darkness that Pazuzu's now bringing. A strange man watches Marin, the wind blows, dogs start to fight, and now we get the feeling that something is coming. Now from here we go to Georgetown, which is where we're introduced to Chris. After hearing some strange noises in the attic, she goes into Reagan's room to find the window open and the curtains blowing in the wind. Pazuzu has arrived, and we later learn Reagan's been communicating with someone called Captain Howdy through the use of a Ouija board. The name Howdy is very important because it's used as a way to manipulate Reagan and make her start to trust this evil entity. Later on, we see a magazine cover with both Chris and Reagan on it, and this tells us that the former is going through a divorce. Is actually also names Reagan's dad as being Howard, and Howdy is a nickname for Howard, so her not really seeing her father that much could be why this was chosen to make her open up more. Now at the film set, we're introduced to Burke, and we see Chris in her element. Friedkin originally wanted Audrey Hepburn for the role, and this would help to give us the idea that she was a glamorous movie star working on a production. 
Anyway, we get an echo of the scene with Meryn, and see Chris walking through the streets to the tune tubular bells. This has very much become the Exorcist theme, and rewatching the movie, I was surprised at how little the theme's actually used. When it's used, it's for moments like this, but it does make even the more simple things seem unnerving. Chris is passed in the street by children dressed up as things for Halloween, and we also see nuns walking by with their cloaks blowing in the wind. These moments were put in place to show that religion is all around her, but she refuses to really acknowledge it or take it seriously. It creates this almost otherworldly feeling, and Chris ends up hearing Karis talking about how his mother's unable to be treated. This is drowned out by the sound of an aeroplane, but Karis being unable to take care of his mother is one of the reasons his faith's shaken. Seeing her wither into nothing with him being helpless to stop it, it has just broken him, and thus he doesn't share the love for Christianity that he used to have. He refuses to help a homeless man that claims to be a Catholic and walks through downtrodden neighborhoods refusing to acknowledge the rot. Sound is used expertly too with a tray. See, just the screeching and almost growling and screaming of the city really catches you off guard and it makes the streets feel like they're their own living and breathing entity. Now in Reagan's basement, we can see the clay models and also catch a collage up behind her. Huge shoutouts to Rob AJ, and he pointed out that we have the wolf from Little Red Riding Hood up to the top left. This of course has the wolf dressing up as a meager old woman, and this is so it can appear a certain way. This is similar to how the demon wears Reagan throughout the movie, and both stories feature the creatures spouting things off whilst they're sat in a bed. Rob also pointed out that we have the story of Hansel and Gretel on the right, with a witch wearing a blue cloak that's the exact same colour as the jumper that Reagan wears in this scene. Now Chris finds the Ouija board, and though she goes to play with it, Reagan refuses to let her touch it. Anyway, we get a couple of calm scenes with her to keep the tension lower and watch Karis dealing with his mother. We learn that he had a passion for psychiatry, which has helped him deal with those that come to him for help. The church paid his way through medical school, and since then he's been someone who priests can go to for therapy. You also learn that Reagan's father never called her on her birthday, and it's these vulnerabilities that the demon uses to sink its claws in. Now we cut to Chris waking up in the night, and on her bedside we can see a picture of Reagan clasping her hands together. This is of course symbolic of a prayer, and it's something that Chris later does in front of it during the hypnosis scene. When the demon's within Reagan, she too joins her hands like this, and from the look on her face in the photo, we're meant to draw the religious connections to see how she's praying for help. Reagan talks about how her bed was shaking, and we cut to a shot of the attic to once more let us know that there's something up there. Upon opening it up, Friedkin layers the sound of wind into the ladder to hint to us that Captain Howdy's coming. We get a quick shot of Reagan sitting with her eyes open and then cut to the test with Howdy appearing on screen as she looks up. In the waiting room, we see two boys fighting and this may be building off the back of the two dogs fighting at the start of the movie. That's probably a reach, but there's this continuing idea of chaos whenever the demon's around. Doctors are unable to see what's going on, and thus they just prescribe Ritalin and hope the problem goes away. Anyway, we see Karis visiting his mother in an asylum, and this was actually done for real with many of the women being mental patients. Using hidden cameras, Friedkin films some of these moments, and the dress and bed shots we see echo the look Reagan gets later on. Now from here we cut to the party and meet Father Dyer. Played by an actual priest, he helped to consult on the film and also advise things. It's through him that we learn Karis' mother passed away after being left by herself, and though it's a throwaway line, it shows the movie wants you to connect the dots yourself. Now that's very much the case when it comes to Burke's death too. We catch him insinuating that one of the staff members who works for Chris is a Nazi, and later on he's found at the bottom of the steps. His head is completely turned around, and with Reagan's bedroom window being close to this, it is suspected that he was thrown out of it. A Pazuzu actually confirms that they killed Burke by making fun of his twisted head and saying this. Do you know what she did? <laughs> Your c***ing daughter. This shows that the demon broke Burke's neck before throwing him out of the window, much like what Kinderman suspects. Now just before Burke's ushered out, we get a shot of Chris putting Reagan to bed, and we can see the window open with the wind blowing. The party goes play piano, which is when Reagan interrupts them and urinates on the floor. Again, her dress is very much echoing the asylum patients and the people that think that she's troubled rather than being possessed. She's put to bed and then after Chris hears her screaming, she rushes in to see her bed jumping about. Now what you might not know is that this actually caused real life injury to Linda Blair and she badly fractured her back when filming this scene. Led to years of health issues with her and Ellen Burstyn didn't escape the film unscathed either. 
During the scene in which Reagan throws her to the floor, the stuntman actually yanked the wire too hard, and this also left the actress with back problems that plagued her for decades. We then see tests being carried out as the doctors try and get to the bottom of what's going on, and these are traumatic as hell. Now, in talking about The Exorcist, you'll probably hear stories about people fainting and walking out of the film when they were watching it in theaters. This helped to build towards its reputation, but what a lot of people don't know is that most of the walkouts happen during these scenes. It's just not nice seeing a kid put through tests like this, and I don't even think we'll get away with putting them in the video, so they're probably blurred by my editors. You have things like needles going in necks with blood spurting out, extremely loud machines, and they're deliberately put in place to torture Reagan and the viewer. There's also a hidden killer in these scenes too, not like it's part of the movie, but an actual killer killer. At one point we see a bearded radiologist loading Reagan into a scanner. This is actually convicted murderer Paul Bateson, who was suspected of being a serial killer that hunted gay men. William Freed can actually use this as the basis for his movie Cruising, which starred Al Pacino when it centered on the murders that Paul was believed to have carried out. Anyway, when they're looking over the x-ray results, we see a nurse pop her head in, and this is actually a cameo by Linda Blair's real-life mother. The doctors visit the house and they see firsthand what's going on with Reagan, but all this does is lead to more traumatizing tests. Appearing much like the Virgin Mary herself, we see how Chris is a broken woman now who's very much at her wit's end. Psychiatry is suggested, she goes home defeated, and we see her driving home past a big group of people and also an ambulance. Again, we have to put together what's going on here, but this is actually the side of Burke's death who, in the next scene we learn, was left alone with Reagan. The window's wide open and the wind is blowing in, and Burke was supposed to be up there with her, but he's nowhere to be seen. At this point, Chris learns the bad news, and drunkenness is blamed on Burke falling down the stairs. Now from here we get the spider scene in which Reagan crawls down the stairs backwards. The scene was originally removed from the movie because the wires in it could be seen. There was also a moment in which Reagan's tongue popped out like a snake and this was just seen as being a bit too goofy. Friedkin thought it undercut the moment in which Chris learned of Burke's death so they steered clear from it until they were able to change things digitally. Either way, we cut to Reagan under hypnosis and we can see that her right arm's held up. This is another subtle nod to Pazuzu, and when we look at the statue of him, we can see that one arm is also raised, like what we have here. Anyway, from here we cut to Karis running, whilst Kinderman watches on. He says, Did you look like a boxer? And you can catch photos of Karis in the ring earlier in the film. YouTube channel Master of the Macabre did a brilliant breakdown on Kinderman, and they talked about the techniques that he used throughout the film. He gets people to open up to him because he comes across as a friend, and in the end, this allows him to ask more questions. With Karis, he says, You like movies? Very much. Well, I get passes to the best shows in town. Mrs. K, though, you know, she gets tired, you know, never likes to go. It's too bad. Yeah, I hate to go alone. You know, I love to talk, film, you know, discuss, to critique. You want to see a film with me? And later on with Chris, he leaves by asking if he can have an autograph. That's okay. I, I, I really hate to ask you this, but... What? For, for my daughter, could you please give an autograph? And what's your name? I lied, it's for me. <laughs> Although he's a fan of film, this is basically him flattering her so they don't end on a bad note, and if they meet again, then she's less likely to be defensive. He ends his meeting with Karis by making a joke, and therefore, he's more likely to be friendly with him if he comes snooping around again. Exorcist 3 did make it out like they were great, great friends, which kind of retconning that a bit, mate, but these scenes at least make it seem like they had at least a friendly rapport. Now, whilst he finds the clay model at the side of Burke's death, we see as Chris discovers a crucifix in Reagan's bedroom. This is the same one that Reagan later uses to, well, you know, and you might wonder how this gets from here back to her bedroom in the next scene. Rob Ager actually did a video documenting it, and when Kinderman arrives, you can see Chris put it on the table. She then sits and has a meeting with him, and upon going back outside, the crucifix is gone, showing that Reagan grabbed it during this time. After going to Karis, Chris convinces him to see her daughter, and we get a call back to the homeless man from before. Father, would you help an old altar boy? I'm a Catholic. Can you help an old altar boy, Father? Reagan also vomits on Karis when he asks questions. As I'm sure you can guess, this was done only in one take, and the reaction to it is actually real. It was supposed to just hit Jason Miller in the chest, but it missed and went into his face, which is why he looks as shocked as he is. 
He does think Reagan is faking it though, due to the demon saying they're the devil and also the fact that they don't know Karis' name. Even though she's strapped down, we also get a creepy shadow looming in her window which Kinderman sees from across the street. Now we cut to Karis listening to tapes and can also catch a banner that says Tasukiti. Butchered that, but the word means help me in Japanese, and this phrase also appears on Reagan not too long after. Now, this was achieved by Linda Blair lying below a foam latex replica of a stomach, with the words being written on with a paintbrush and also some cleaning fluid. Both the foam and fluid had a reaction with one another, which then caused the words to bubble up and come out. Anyway, we begin the first exorcism of Reagan, which is carried out by Karis. What an excellent day for an exorcism. You'd like that? But wouldn't that drive you out of Reagan? It would bring us together. No spoiler alert, but this is what happens at the end with the exorcism bringing the demon and Karis together. Karis also asks the demon its name, and it replies, La plume de ma tante. Ah! This translates to the pen of my aunt, and it's a phrase that's become a joke in French education because it's taught to people trying to learn the language, e even though it's completely nonsensical. Now later on, Marin asks Chris if Reagan has a middle name, and in Catholicism, they actually have a tie to possession. A long time ago, it was thought that demons needed to know your name in order to possess you, and thus having a middle name meant it was more difficult because people rarely used them. Now though he says he used holy water, Karis reveals it's actually just tap water, making things seem less supernatural. However, upon recording her screams, he's able to play them backwards. Kind of feel like this might be a nod to Stairway to Heaven by Led Zeppelin, which was released just two years prior. Was said to have satanic messages in it if you played the song backwards, and it might be kind of referencing that, though it could also be a reach. Now in the screams, he hears the word Merrin, and upon requesting an exorcism from the church, that's who he's paired up with. Merrin's past is revealed, and he arrives and puts the demon through the exorcism. Nowadays, the breath would just be done digitally, but to me, you can always tell when they fake it, like my last girlfriend. Here though, they had to chill the set and have it below freezing in order for it to be cold enough to produce these effects. I think Linda Blair really comes into her own here, and she embodies the demon in her amazing performance. I think you'd be hard pressed to find a kid who could pull this kind of thing off, and she really turns into a twisted and horrifying monster. The effects do a brilliant job too, with a head spinning added in, and they even have breath coming out of that to make it seem less fake. Now she's also aided by Mercedes McCambridge, who was hired to perform the demon's iconic voice. Before recording, she swallowed raw eggs, chain smoked, drank lots of alcohol, and it all helped to mess up her voice for the film. Now you can really see why so many movies have tried to imitate this, but they really fail to capture the level of fear and subtlety the exorcist brings. Though they have a lot of over the top things happening, they also have the more chilling horror, such as Kara entering the room by himself to find his mother sat in bed. Karis's biggest, I guess the word is regret, his biggest regret is that he feels like he abandoned his mother to die on her own. Though he tried to be there, she passed away in her bed and the demons tormenting Karis here by manifesting as her. She also puts on her voice and Marin decides to take over, which allows Pazuzu to enact its part of the plan. We never actually see Marin's death until the Exorcist 2, which I won't go into, and instead Karis discovers him keeled over with Reagan on the bed giggling. Karis attacks, which leads to the necklace being ripped off, and at this point, the demon ends up entering him. Hurtling down the stairs, we can guess enough here to understand what happened with Burke, and the movie allows us to fill in the blanks. Now when we see his body lying at the bottom of the stairs, we can also see graffiti on the left that says fight pigs. This is actually a reference to the Bible itself, namely the story in which Jesus exercised some demons into a herd of pigs. Although Karis dies, Reagan is okay, and at the bottom of the steps dies, absolves Karis of his sins and gives him his last rites. We do learn things about what really happened here in The Exorcist 3, but I feel like that's a story for another breakdown. Now we end with the family picking up and leaving, and originally we ended on a more ambiguous note. Freakin said that this was his vision for some time, but bloody was very much of the idea that they needed to add a bit more to it. This is why we get the lingering shots and moments with Kinnaman and Dyer that give us a bit more of a hopeful and optimistic final scene. Chris gives Dyer the necklace, but he returns it to the family, and this will hopefully help protect them going forward in the future. The theatrical cut ends with Dyer walking past the window, looking at the stairs, and you get the feeling that the demon might have won. However, the director's cut adds a scene in of Kinnaman showing up, and he invites Dyer out for a film. It's much like what he did with Karis, and Friedkin actually said that, and I'm not lying, 
He said that Karis was somewhat living on through Dyer and that their friendship was starting again. Bit weird, um, and the way they end it, it's very like Casablanca, and I think this is going to be the start of a beautiful friendship. Anyway, that closes out the video, and I hope you enjoyed the breakdown. Let me know your thoughts on that ending as well. You know, there's two versions of it, and if you've seen both, I'd love to hear which one you prefer. Now, if you are thinking about re-watching the movie and want to know what one to go with, then there are some differences that you have to bear in mind. The subliminal poppings and face changes happen in the version you've never seen before, which is also called the director's cut. If you want more of a kind of, I don't know, subtle one, then, then I would say the theatrical one's for you. Personally, I, I prefer the little pops and stuff, but that's more because I like doing easter egg videos and, and pointing out things that are inserted into frames. Either way, the film still stands as one of the best horrors ever made, and you know what, I hope you've enjoyed this journey with us back through the film. If you want something else to watch, then definitely check out our breakdown of The Shining, which I still think is one of the best breakdowns on the channel. Also, I know a lot of you guys are after seeing us cover Alien 3, so yes, gonna put myself through that for the next video, and I hope you come back with that in the next couple of weeks. By the way, a huge thank you for sitting through the breakdown. I've been Paul, you've been the best, and I'll see you next time. Take care, peace.